check the facts behind the stories making the headlines. Go to the BBC News website and app to answer any questions you have about the big stories of the day. Reality Check. Get the facts straight. This is Impact. I'm Nancy Kachingira. The UN accuses the military in Myanmar of killing their way out of a crisis after the junta executes two well-known pro-democracy activists. We'll be hearing from the Minister of Human Rights of the Myanmar Government of National Unity. Pope Francis is in Canada, where he's expected to apologize for the abuse and cultural genocide inflicted on indigenous children at Catholic schools. In his first State of the Nation address, newly elected President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. pledges to revitalize the Philippines' beleaguered economy. And as firefighters in California struggle to contain another huge wildfire, the U.S. considers declaring a national climate emergency. All of that's coming up here on Impact. Welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. The United Nations is accusing the Myanmar military authorities of using executions to kill their way out of a crisis of their own creation. State media said two men, both well-known pro-democracy figures, were put to death, along with two others. Chao Min Yu, who you can see here on the left, was also known as Ko Jimmy. And he was a long-time political activist. Piozia Dao was a hip-hop artist who'd been working as an elected lawmaker before the coup which overthrew the elected government last year. The UN says Myanmar's military has killed more than 2,000 people since it seized power, and 30 of them, 30 percent of them, have died in custody. Well, Piozia Dao's mother has given this interview to the BBC. <laughs> I want to arrange a funeral plan according to traditional customs. I have to know what day and how the execution was carried out. I asked the prison authorities to return his body or his ashes, but they only said the execution was carried out over the weekend. Although family members refused to return until the bodies were recovered, we were forced to return as the prison authorities did not respond. When we met on Zoom last Friday, my son was healthy and smiling. He asked me to send his reading glasses, dictionary and some money to use in the prison. So I collected those things and brought them to the prison today. And that's why I didn't think they would kill him. What I wanted to say for him was that I didn't know in advance that he would be executed. I am proud of my son. He even gave his life. If possible, I want to take his bones and ashes and place them at a martyr's temple. The reaction from the families has been one of utter shock, and this here is the action we got from Human Rights Watch. This is clearly a signal to the Myanmar people from the junta that they are prepared to do whatever it takes, whatever rights abuses, whatever atrocities, whatever crimes, uh, that it, they think they need to do in order to try to control the situation. They are now moving to execute political prisoners. That is the message today, that we will stop at nothing. Uh, it is a sign of the depravity of the Myanmar junta that they are prepared to take this kind of step. Earlier, we spoke with Ong Chao Mo, advisor to the Minister of Human Rights of the Myanmar Government of National Unity. Let's hear what he had to say. We have been, the National Unity Government had made uh, clearly announcement to the, to the, to the whole populations in the country to defend themselves. And, and of course, we have been in order to defend ourselves and in order to provide the the uh, the protections to each of the citizens of the, of the country, each of the civilians, 
we the the government leaders has made the announcement to self defend and 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 the government has already established people defend force and things like that so the only way to make this uh, this um, this junta understand is to speak on their own language i'm not inciting violence here however uh, million million of people in burma have tried to peacefully protest in return what the people got is uh, like bullets uh, while peacefully protesting so this is a, a military which has a very bad history track record of killing murdering and raping uh, women and and uh, while the while these uh, the, the civilian itself will will peacefully claim things and the the response would be like very brutal crackdowns and things like that so, so the the people indeed is very very angry that the the, the the 50 people like 50 million people versus a few hundred thousand people who has gone uh, it is critically the situation so the the i am sure uh, there is no not yet public announcement being made by the national united government i am sure there will be very uh, strategic and operational response by the, right. by the government so what about the international response do you think that carries uh, much weight when it comes to putting pressure on the military junta and how would you like the international community to respond to these executions i think but the international community have have enough evidence and enough in order to do what needs to be done to control to these things and to ensure that that the impunity the cycle of impunity of such crimes is ending and uh, the international community must cut all ties with the junta and 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 ensure that they are they when are, you they say are... cut all ties uh, to what extent do you mean could you just describe what you mean by that? Mean that any relationship, these are the guys, the, the, the junta leaders are the guys who has very fresh blood, as I mentioned, from genocides and from crimes against humanity, all sorts of international uh, uh, international crimes. They have, they have been continuously committing against its own people. And international community still, like various countries around the world, are indirectly or directly engaging with the junta in it diplomatically or in, in in economically and and in of course the country cannot stand alone uh like like the, they have territorial control for the moment compared to our government like the government of the people that has the legitimacy uh, due to the fact that they have the control over the over the military equipment and military personnel of the country so indeed in order to but the, what they couldn't control is the people's mindsets and people's mentality to rule those people. And they couldn't fully act as a government and they will never be and the people of Burma will not let. So international community must support uh, the people of Myanmar in order to put the country to the path of democracy and to ensure this, this country is has uh, truly principle on the principle of democracy, federal democracy, wh where it is. Uh, it's treated okay. everyone in the country f fairly, and uh, if the international community cannot support the 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 the, uh, the uh, Burmese people uh, later on, uh, the, there will be not much to do for international community to to bring back the country to to, to the path, path of democracy. Speaking to us from an undisclosed location and in exile, that was Ong Cha Mo from the Unity National Government. Now, Pope Francis will visit a former residential school in Canada later today where he's expected to make an historic personal apology to indigenous survivors of abuse. It's believed more than 150,000 children were taken from their families and mistreated in Catholic-run institutions. But the detail and extent of the pontiff's apology is proving controversial, as Mark LaBell reports. Preparing to confront his flock's terrible past in Canada. But not everyone appears as pleased as Canada's Governor General, seen here welcoming the pontiff with the Pope's agenda this week. And that's a part of the problem we've had with the church is that they have not been really including us in the proper planning of this process. On Canadian soil last year, the remains of 215 children were found at this former residential school in British Columbia closed in 1978 after forcibly assimilating indigenous youth. In all, more than 150,000 indigenous children were subjected to abuse, malnutrition, rape and death at similar schools, around 70% of which were run by the Catholic Church. 
A government-backed Truth and Reconciliation Commission attempted to assess the damage by speaking to around 7,000 former students. This was the darkest, saddest, most unknown chapter in Canadian history. So it took us those six years to hear directly from the students their stories of the lived experience in those schools. Many of them wanted to hear an apology, but words are one thing. I actually coined a new word, I think, when I said it's about reconciliation. There was this apology to Indigenous Canadians from the Pope in April at the Vatican. I joined Canadian brothers, bishops, in apologising. Many now hope he will expand on those historic remarks whilst visiting Canada. This week, the 85-year-old plans numerous public events and private meetings, including a visit on Monday to the site of a former residential school in Masquazis in Western Canada, where he will meet Chief Littlechild. Every kind of abuse that was talked about, whether it was physical, mental, cultural, spiritual, sexual, I went through all of that as a child. But it's going to take both of us working together on a path towards reconciliation to make life better for the survivors right now. To help heal the pain, some survivors and Indigenous leaders are calling for financial compensation, the release of school records and support for extraditing an accused abuser. The Pope says the spirit of this trip is one of penance. It is also a test of his health and of how well he can mend old wounds. Mark Lobel, BBC News. Stay with us on Impact. Still to come, old faces are back on the street for one last time as Neighbours shuts its doors after more than 35 years. Check this out. It hasn't been such a long time since people first started shopping online and it was easy to keep up with the clicks. Little by little by little by more, the clicks added up to be more than the stores and e-tailers worked harder than ever before because they had to keep up with the clicks. All of a sudden, there are so many must-dos if you want to keep selling, like delivery there, no there, or there. And make it tomorrow, first thing. No time for borders. Got to stay in control to stay in the flow and continue to grow. But we'll help you. Keep up with the clicks. In our connected world, all news is international. So for in-depth analysis and correspondence covering both home and global events, get a deeper understanding and find out what is really going on. BBC World News America. You're watching Impact on BBC World News. The newly elected president of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., has pledged to revitalize his country's beleaguered economy in his first State of the Nation address. Let's hear what he had to say. We live in difficult times, brought about by some forces of our own making, but certainly also by forces that are beyond our control. But we have, and we will continue to find solutions, and these are some of them. In terms of the economy, we will implement a sound fiscal management. Tax administration reforms will be in place to increase revenue collection. Expenditure priorities will be realigned and spending efficiency will be improved. So that's the new president speaking there. He's the son of the late Philippi Philippine dictator Ferdinand Marcos and he won a landslide election in May after promising to invest heavily in new infrastructure and tackle climate change. His critics accuse him of whitewashing his father's legacy, ignoring the thousands who were tortured and killed during the decades of Marcos' rule. Leanne Buan is a reporter for the online news site Rappler. It's a very radical change of tune from his predecessor, President Rodrigo Duterte. There were no curses, there were no threats, and there were no um, stunning pronouncements. But also notable, there was no mention of human rights at all. Remember that his predecessor is leaving a bloody legacy of 27,000 suspects killed in his campaign against drugs and another 500 in killed lawyers, politicians, and activists. And 
it is being investigated by the International Criminal Court. So the non-mention of human rights and killings and accountability and impunity is very disappointing to the human rights community, both here and abroad. And I mean, from this speech, how much sense did you get of how much space there will be for dissent or for disagreeing with the president? Because there was very tight security around this address, despite the fact that he won a landslide victory and therefore should be quite popular. Yes, another a non another one that was excluded from the speech is there was no mention at all about the peace talks, about free speech, about any other um, democratic values. And as you mentioned, there was a very a tight security around the speech. It was a very rare, huge deployment of uh, the uniformed personnel. There was a very rare declaration of a no protest zone um, in the thoroughfare where um, the, the protests have been traditionally uh, held year in and year out. And on top of that, the House of Representatives banned the wearing of dresses and suits that contain any political message, which is also, you know, a very honored tradition uh, for this event every year. And Leanne, how would you describe the mood in the country now? The president has called for unity. Does it feel like the country is rallying behind him? I think uh, we are still in a buffer or a honeymoon period for the new president. We have seen a very different side of President Marcos that we didn't see during the campaign. And it was actually the uh, most common used criticism against him during the campaign that he did not mention any policy. In this speech, he mentioned very concrete policies, actually very specific targets, but very, um, very central to the economy. And some are saying that uh, it is very predictable for the president to mention economic goals, especially were in a pandemic. So they were looking for more um, policies towards the human rights area. And of course, uh, um, I'm sure the international community is also waiting for any stance on whether where the Philippines would place in the United States and China conflict. But he made very vague um, um, pronouncements towards that also. Diane Buan is a reporter for the online news site Rappler. Now, let's ho head over to the U.S., where thousands of people in central California have been told to prepare to leave their homes as a wildfire near the Yosemite National Park continues to burn out of control. The state's worst fire so far this year is spreading rapidly, with nearly 60 square kilometers now ablaze. It's already forced more than 6,000 people from their homes. Here's more from our correspondent, James Clayton. These fires are hungry, fast-moving and totally out of control. Firefighters here say the Oak Fire is 0% contained. 3,000 people have been forced to leave their homes. That's my educated guess. In the nearby town of Mariposa, a school is being used to house evacuated residents. This man is sleeping on the floor. It's so warm, he says, he doesn't need a tent. Classrooms like these have been turned into temporary shelter. Many of the people here have been here for three days already, and they say they simply don't know how long they'll have to stay here for. Joy moved to her new house during the pandemic to get out of the city. She watched on in horror as the blaze approached her house. I could see the flames. It was billowing. It was real. It was like, I don't have time to think about this. Just got to move and move fast. And, and have you heard about what's happened to your house yet? No, I don't know. Just hoping I have something to go back to. Taylor is 10 years old and was visiting her grandmother when the fire forced them to flee. It was very scary. And what's it been like living here? Well, no, very not comfortable. At a community meeting, local residents had questions. Just wondering, are we talking days, weeks? What are we thinking about being able to go back home? Questions the authorities here simply can't answer. As soon as we can, we will definitely um, Get you guys back that. With the fire raging and moving unpredictably, it's possible many will be stuck here indefinitely, wondering if they have anything to go back to. James Clayton, BBC News, Mariposa County, California. Tunisians vote today in a referendum on a new constitution, which, if it's approved, will concentrate power in the hands of President Kais Saied. It's the country where the Arab Spring first began more than a decade ago. And now there are real fears that the uprising's most notable success story is about to slip back into a dictatorship. Our Middle East correspondent Anna Foster reports from the capital, Tunis. The 
Wahl has just been released from a police cell. His wife, Shaweha, eight months pregnant, has waited on the street for him for 20 hours. Wahl was arrested for protesting against Tunisia's new constitution. But as a young couple, more than a decade ago, they demonstrated together in the original Arab Spring. Along with thousands of others, they called for democracy and replaced their leader. It's very difficult and we, we didn't have any rights. It's very dangerous if it happens again. After 11 years of protesting and trying, no, that's not what I want uh, for me, for my family and for the Tunisian people. Tunisia's freedoms are moving in reverse. A year ago, President Kai's side made sweeping changes. He sacked the prime minister, dissolved the government and suspended parliament. In June, he removed 57 judges from their posts, claiming it would stop corruption. Several are now on hunger strike. Mohamed al Kenzari hasn't eaten for 33 days. I'm so exhausted. I feel like a criminal. You try to resist as much as you can, but nobody feels you. You call for your rights, but nobody feels you. Human rights groups, both in Tunisia and abroad, have warned against Kai's side's plan. They say it brings back one-man rule more than a decade after it was swept away. But despite that, it has plenty of supporters. As Tunisians cast their votes, the result is in little doubt. This country's poor and its working class believe the new constitution will boost their struggling economy. They see the president not as a dictator, more a savior. All my family support Kai Sasayed, of course. Whoever serves the interest of the Tunisian state and is a good person, may God help him. I will vote yes, yes, yes. The president will improve our conditions. I pin high hopes on Kai Sayed. Tunisia's democracy was the Arab Spring's most notable achievement. Its revolution succeeded where others failed. But today the country stands on the brink of a new constitution, one which would reverse much of what its people fought for. Anna Foster, BBC News, Tunis. To something a little different now, do you remember this? Everybody you might be singing along there. After almost four decades and 9,000 episodes of daytime drama, the final credits are set to roll on the Australian soap Neighbours this Friday. Among the former stars returning to Ramsey Street for the final episode are Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan. The trailer has been released for the finale. Let's take a peek at what's in store. Well, it certainly feels like the end of an era. It all goes so quickly. Seeing him again, it was like no time had passed at all. Yeah, there's lots of old faces floating about. Do you think Ray still loves me? Your story, my story. I wanted a reason to come back. The street is not going to be the same without you. This is going to be a great new start. Where are you moving to? I don't really know. We might be leaving the street, but we're always going to be in each other's lives. Always. Neighbours scriptwriter Megan Herbert told me why the show, she thinks the show's been so popular internationally. I think, of course, there is the uh, sunny, happy neighbours that everybody sort of grew to, to love and, and turned to as a comfort. But I think that also the thing that neighbours did really well, apart from the kind of high soap, they also did really good suburban drama. And that's what people return to, I think, time after time. And, and smaller stories, humour stories. Um, I think that was the thing that really uh, created the love for the characters and the show. And do you think there was something there about just the time uh, with, that it reflected, the time that it came out, the time that it happened? What was your reaction to the news that the show was ending? Was that a reflection that times had changed? Well, they have changed, haven't they? I mean, broadcasting and viewing, viewing habits now are so different. And I mean, I, I'm a children's book writer as well as a script writer. And, 
talking to children in classrooms, some of them don't even know what a soap opera is anymore. And I think that's just a reflection of things having changed. People are watching things on demand and we've still got the loyal viewers, but um, of course, perhaps not as many new viewers as we used to get every year. So I think that's reflective of what's happening to the soap world. Mm. And there are some big names returning for the finale. Uh, how do you think that's going to work? Do you think they'll fit right in? Oh, look, I, uh, we're uh, all so excited to um, to see all those returns. And I think it speaks so much to the, the sort of longevity of the show and the strength of the show and the fact that um, not just the big stars, but every, every person who's worked on the show has such a fondness for it. And it's so good to see that those people who really didn't need to come back are coming back. I think it says everything. And um, it's a really lovely way to send off the show. It certainly is. What's going to be your enduring memory of your experience of working on this show? Oh, well, I've made so many good friends over the years um, and every different job I, I ta take on now, whether it's cartooning, storybook, um, writing and editing, all of the things I learned at Neighbours I use every day. And I think everyone who worked on the show, whether you're an actor or a writer or a crew member, feels exactly the same way so the people who work there know and the fans know and I just think it's sort of time to celebrate that so I'll, I'll always have that as a huge part of my life everything I learned there Scriptwriter Megan Herbert there. Now, in case you haven't heard, it's been confirmed that next year's Eurovision Song Contest will take place in Britain. This year's event was won by the Ukrainian band Kalash Orchestra, but the organizers decided that Ukraine couldn't host the 2023 event because of the Russian invasion. So it's coming to Britain, which came second in this year's contest. Stay with us on BBC News. Bye for now. Hello, over the last couple of